Good morning and welcome to this Nokia webcast on the topic of biodiversity and the oceans together with our partners, the John Nominen Foundation. My name is Emma Rispoli and I'm here at Nokia's training facility in Botvik on World Ocean Day. Nokia first began conservation work in these coastal areas around the Botvik Manor in the 1980s. In total, these conservation areas, which are located in the inner archipelago of southern Finland, add up to approximately 119 hectares of both sea and land, including 10 islands. In total, Nokia's conservation areas in Finland amount up to 157 hectares. Joining me here today are Tony Darcy from Nokia's ESG team and Ulla Rosenström from the John Nominen Foundation. Tony and Ulla, could you tell us a little bit about the connection and the work between Nokia and the John Nominen Foundation? Yeah, sure. Maybe I start. Um, in December 2022, we signed a three-year partnership agreement with John Nominen, um, which allowed us to uh, support environmental action in the Baltic Sea and the preservation and restoration of the ecosystem, the biodiversity ecosystem in the Baltic Sea. Um, and it was an opportunity as a Finnish company with our Finnish heritage to actually do environmental action in our own backyard. Um, Ulla can maybe tell more about John Norman and Foundation. Yes, thank you. We saved the Baltic Sea and its future generation and its cultural heritage for the future generations. So what it means is that we do very concrete actions to protect the Baltic Sea, which means that we also want to have concrete results. And for us, it's very important to measure the results. We've been doing this for 30, 30 years already. Most of our projects, they actually concentrate on reducing the phosphorus loads of the Baltic Sea, because that's uh, important for decreasing eutrophication, which is really the biggest problem, biggest environmental problem th that we have in the Baltic Sea. Eutrophication takes place when there are too many nutrients in the water body, because that then leads to the plant life, like algae, to grow in excess. Yeah. And you, what you might have seen <laughs> is, is yeah. huge algal blooms when there's a uh, nice warm summers you want to swim but you end up with the toxic at its worst algae blooms there so and that of course yes it uh, affects your recreational value of the baltic sea but it's especially dangerous for other plants and animals which then decreases the biodiversity of the baltic sea but of course there is uh, still hope because uh, we have managed to decrease, we've been working so long and we have decreased the nutrient loads. Actually together with some stakeholders, we have managed to cut down the phosphorus load of the uh, Gulf of Finland by as much as 75% in less than 10 years. So that has actually been called the world record. That's a good achievement. And um, you know, a number of people would probably ask, well, why is Nokia? talking about this why are we involved and I think it's important to to understand that we believe that enhanced connectivity and digital digitalization uh, can actually play a key role in solving many or helping to solve many of the uh, issues and challenges that face the world today um, whether that's actually helping to restore stalling productivity um, whether it's providing inclusive access to opportunities, uh, or in, in, as we're here today talking about, in supporting environmental monitoring and restoring natural ecosystems. Um, for us, the, this program offers the opportunity to work with the Baltic Sea and to look at, explore how digitalization um, and latest technologies can actually help drive um, restoration of the biodiversity and the natural ecosystem in the Baltic Sea. Um, the Baltic Sea in itself is a very interesting body of water. Maybe you can tell us, tell people a little bit about that as well. Yes. Well, the Baltic Sea is actually the youngest sea in the world. It only came to place about 10, to 15,000 years ago, when the glaciers retreated after the last ice age. So, and it is, uh, it's a very 
vulnerable sea in the way that it's very shallow and it's a brackish water, the largest brackish water that we actually have in the world. It means that it has a salinity that's way less than in the other seas, but it's not quite a lake either, which then means for the plants and animals that it's quite difficult to adjust living in the Baltic Sea. And it means that any environmental changes that they take place affect them immediately. And that's why when we're talking about measuring things, it's actually really important to be measuring the temperature, salinity, oxygen, all these things, so that we can actually be prepare beforehand. And now, as we're talking about the climate change, that's of course something that's going to affect the Baltic Sea quicker than other areas. So some people actually talk about the Baltic Sea as a laboratory for changes. And of course, also the Baltic Sea, there's a, quite a lot of pressure on it. Being a small sea, it has a catchment area four times the area of the sea. Catchment area, I mean the rivers around where all the phosphorus loads and maybe harmful substances come in there too. And in the Baltic Sea, it's surrounded by nine countries, which also means a lot of negotiation maybe or agreements with the other countries. I don't know if you know the <laughs> <laughs> the nine countries, but they are, if I go clockwise, so besides Finland, we have Russia, we have Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden. So we have some very big uh, countries there, also with agriculture, which is one of the main sources of diffuse load, phosphorus loads, nutrient loads to the Baltic Sea across, along with the forestry as well. That's interesting because, uh, I mean, I've heard that the Baltic is is relatively dirty sea um, because of that fact that there are so many countries around it and, and so much um, incoming waters from various things with potentially phosphorus, phosphates and fertilizers and historical uh, pollution. But um, you, we are supporting uh, John Norman and some really interesting projects. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the seagrass project in particular? Yes, that is one of our uh, latest projects that we only started this year and it really aims at the saving biodiversity of the Baltic Sea, as I was just talking about more of the phosphorus loads and, and the nutrients. But of course, now that the Baltic Sea is doing better, it is getting cleaner. So now it's actually a time that we can restore some key habitats that have been there but are no longer there. And that's where these uh, seagrass meadows come in. Before I go directly to the project, I just want to maybe make a little bit bigger picture. So these seagrass meadows are actually quite common all over the world. So in all coastal areas, more or less, we have these uh, seagrass meadows that do provide actually shelter and food for many different animals, which make them such an important habitats. And uh, what's more, they are also function as carbon sinks. So now we have this climate change uh, direction here as well, because we can combat climate change. But unfortunately, in the global scale, so during the past 40 years, about one third of these uh, seagrass meadows have actually disappeared. And the same is also has been the problem in the Baltic Sea. So uh, with the because of course plants need sunlight and with, with the eutrophication that has not been the case. So we have many areas in the coastline of Finland too, where they have disappeared. And they are important for, of course, the plant life, other plants that grow on the seagrass and for the fish and the small creatures that they graze there, they provide shelter, the carbon sinks, but also the way that they, they are on sandy bottoms and they have these roots so they actually also combat erosion of the coastal areas, which is very important. And in some areas, that is actually one of the key issues why we need the sea meadows there. And also they bind nutrients, with, which makes the water cleaner. So there are many important functions that these meadows have, and that's why we want to bring them back. And that work we are doing here in the Baltic Sea, we're doing it together with Metsahallitus Nature and Conservation Unit. They have already three years experience of doing this, but they are doing it only for the government owned areas. And as what John Nurminen Foundation usually comes, when we come into these projects, it means that we can also do it on privately owned. I mean, we try to involve 
private owners of sea areas to do this. And what we concretely do is we transplant. So we restore it by taking carefully selected, of course, uh, seagrasses from other seabeds and then we move it to places where we think that they can flourish. So it's done by scuba divers and we're talking about three meters depth, kind of. But in all in this, although this is a local thing, but as I said that this is a global worry and an issue that these seagrass meadows are disappearing. So we've actually joined forces with some southern European marine conservation foundations as well in Italy and France at the moment where they're doing similar replanting and restoring seagrass uh, meadows. And the idea here is that we want to bring to people's uh, in general more attention to conserving the marine and talking about the ocean well-being. Thank you, Ola. And um, turning on to more of the technology use cases that we might see in the future, we at Nokia believe that there is no green without, without digital. So, Tony, maybe you could give us a few examples of how, how we might see technology being used in the future to protect our, our natural habitats and biodiversity, and in particular, the oceans. Well, I think, uh, I think it, uh, there are a number of uh, options and use cases. Um, and potential use cases. If we just look at uh, 5G sensors, uh, analytics, and other advanced technologies that are coming online, um, they provide instant, up-to-date, and constant information and data. And that can be used for environmental monitoring, and it can be used for uh, early warning systems, for example, with forest fires or other natural disasters or extreme events, of which we've seen many. So there's that role. Then if you look at the uh, optical fibers that actually are the backbone of the internet today, they connect countries and they connect continents. Um, those when we're looking at those, obviously we look at um, innovations to detect issues on the fibers themselves in the telco networks. But that same innovation can also be applied to climate change monitoring. So whether it's temperature shifts or ocean swells or even earthquakes, you can apply the same technology. Um, and then finally, just as another example, um, subsea cables. How can you use the dark fiber in, in the ocean already um, with innovation such as acoustic sensing, which on the one hand can help protect by um, observing potential uh, hazards such as shipping or other hazards that are coming, but also on the other hand can be used to collect data and information that informs scientific and uh, educational research in the environment arena. So there are many uses for technology and there are many potential cases, use cases that we can see on the horizon. And those will only increase as technology advances. It's about how you use the technology that's there and how you apply new technology and innovate. Thank you, Tony. And thank you everyone for joining us here in Botvik on World Ocean Day. To find out more about Nokia and our sustainability work, visit nokia.com forward slash sustainability and why not give our social channels a follow. For more information on the John Nomenen Foundation, please visit their website on johnnormisensatio.fi.